morning. I'd like to welcome everyone here this morning as we enter into this first hour of worship this morning. We've been encouraged and edified by our worship thus far, and so thankful for the songs that Bo has led and for the prayer that Buddy and led, and, and looking forward to our continued worship this morning as we strive to worship God in spirit and in truth. We have many who are visiting with us this morning, uh, familiar faces that are traveling here with family and others, and we're so thankful for your presence with us this morning. For this morning's lesson, we're going to continue a study that we started last week, and it's just a two-part series, so we're going to wrap it up this morning. But if you would, open up to Psalm 130. Psalm 130 will get our text that we began with last week. The psalmist writes, Out of the depths I have cried to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits. And in his word I do hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. Yes, more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is mercy. And with him is abundant redemption. And he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. We recognized last week as we went through the lesson how awesome it is that we have the opportunity have our sins forgiven. The forgiveness of sins, that's what we talked about. And how much of a blessing it is and, and how awesome it is. We have such a loving and merciful and gracious God. This is evident through the psalm that we just read, the fact that we have forgiveness of sins. And we recognized some points last week. We recognized some questions regarding forgiveness. And we answered those questions. The first question we looked at, looked at is, is why do we need forgiveness of sins in the first place? We recognize from the psalm that it's something that's, that's a blessing, that's great, and that's awesome. It shows who God is. It shows God's love. But why is this such a big deal in the first place? And we answered that by noting some verses and, and recognizing the fact that we need it because man made the choice to sin. Man, man makes the choice to sin. Not only does man make the choice, but he makes the choice individually to sin this is something that each man makes the choice to do and whenever that happens what is brought about is death and the separation from god we then went from there and answered the question how and when are sins are forgiven so i understand uh, the fact that, 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 that we need forgiveness of sins because we put ourselves in that position but then how and when are sins forgiven and we recognize the sins are forgiven because of the sacrifice of Jesus. In other words, without the sacrifice of Jesus, there would be no hope. There would be no way for sins to be forgiven. We would all be lost in our iniquities. But because of the sacrifice of Jesus, the perfect sacrifice, there is now hope for us to have our sins forgiven. That's how sins are forgiven. It's through Jesus. It's through his blood. But when does that happen? We recognize that sins are forgiven when the alien sinner one who has not been forgiven at all at any point in time, one, one who has committed sin and not been forgiven of that sin, whenever they believe, repent, confess, and are baptized. And then we recognized as well that once that happens, that if that now Christian sins, that there is something that they have to do, that there is conditions that they have to meet as well. The Christian who sins, after their sins have been forgiven, do they need to do anything? We answered that by recognizing the fact that the Christian who sins needs to repent of that sin. They need to confess that sin, and they need to pray for forgiveness of that sin. And we recognize what the Bible means happens to those sins. So I understand the fact that, 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 that I, we need forgiveness of sins. It's so important because of the fact that we've separated ourselves from God. We did this by our own choosing, making the choice to go against God's law. We recognize how and when sins are forgiven, but then we went into the question of, so whenever sins are forgiven, what actually happens to those sins? And what we recognize from Scripture is that sins are cleansed, that they are taken away, and that they are no longer remembered. They're gone, they're done away with. And we concluded with, what are the results of having sins forgiven? And the result is, we now have assurance and are ready for the judgment day. 
This is how Paul had assurance. This is how we can have assurance. Because our sins are forgiven and remembered no more. And I would encourage you, if you weren't here last week, to go listen to that sermon. And the reason why I say that, or you can go online, and and the PowerPoint notes from last week are going to be on there. The reason is because it sets up with what we're going to talk about today. It's what we're going to talk about last time. We recognize how big of a blessing it is to have our sins forgiven, to have that guilt removed, to no longer have that sin there, that it is gone and it is remembered no more, and we can now live confident and assured for that judgment day. We recognize that last time. And again, there are scriptures that were laid out. You need to go back and go listen to that because it's going to set up with what we're going to talk about today. And what we're going to talk about today are those who teach something different regarding the forgiveness of of sins. They teach forgiveness of sins. That sins, in a way or in a sense, are forgiven. But they go about it in a completely different way than what Scripture lays out with what we talked about last time. Essentially, what we do, or what, what they do, is they go down the path of taking and twisting Scripture. They go down the path of offering hope where there really is no hope in their doctrine. And we recognize the warnings against false doctrine in the improper handling of Scripture. And that applies to this topic of the forgiveness of sins. I want us to first recognize a few things before we get into this. I I want us to lay some groundwork and understand why it's important that we talk about these doctrinal matters when it comes to forgiveness of sins. Because a lot of people might be like, well, it's not that big of a deal. I mean, they believe in some form of forgiveness. You believe in a different form. I mean, we all believe in forgiveness, right? So it's all good. We need to recognize some things regarding taking and twisting scripture. I want us to first understand and recognize from 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 17 through 22. Peter writing here, warning those about false teachers and the dangers that they bring. And in verse 17 of chapter 2, the chapter that's dedicated to false teachers, he says these are wells without water, talking about these false teachers and the doctrine that they bring. These are wells without water, clouds carried by a tempest, for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. For when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, They allure through lust of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who have lived in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollution of the world through the knowledge of the Lord uh, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled, uh, entangled in them, overcome and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning, for it would have been better for them to have not known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the Holy Commandment delivered, uh, the Holy Commandment delivered to them. But it has happened to them, according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. Understand what's being pointed out. These doctrines that they teach, they appear to offer hope. Recognize what he says there in verse 17. Recognize the, 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 the language that, that, that is used here. These are wells without water. A well provides refreshment, provides water. But then you get up to it and there's no water there. There's hope whenever you see the well, but then you get there and there's no water. That's what these doctrines do. They offer hope, but there is no hope in the end. They speak it with great swelling empty words saying that there is liberty, there is freedom in it. But in reality, there is no freedom in it. There is no liberty in it. You actually have gone back into bondage of sin. We're going to talk about that. As we go throughout this lesson, also a little bit later in Peter, in chapter three, in Second Peter, chapter three, verses fourteen through seventeen, whenever Peter is talking about the judgment day to come, he just concluded and, and talked about the fact that we are assured that judgment is going to occur, that, that Christ is going to return because it's been promised to us. He says, beginning in verse fourteen, therefore, beloved, because we know that Christ is going to return, we don't know when it's going to be, but we know he's going to. Looking forward to these things be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless and, and consider the long suffering that the long suffering of our lord is salvation as also our beloved brother paul uh, paul according to the wisdom given to him has written to you as also in all his epistles speaking them of these things in which some or in which are some things hard to understand which untaught and unstable people take and twist to their own destruction as they do the rest of the scripture 
You need to be weary of those who take it twist scripture to their own destruction. Why? Because it brings about their destruction, but if you follow, it's going to bring about your destruction as well, and you will no longer be prepared for that judgment day. So it's important. Doctrine matters, and 2 John points that out more than anything. 2 John, chapter, starting in chapter 7, for many deceivers talking about false teachers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an, antichrist, and an antichrist. Look to yourselves. That means beware. Beware. Why? That we do not lose those things we worked for, but that we may receive the full reward. Beware that these false teachers are out there so you don't lose your salvation. Beware that you don't follow their doctrine so you don't lose their salvation. Why? Verse 9, because whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house, nor greet him, for he who greets him shares, uh, greets him shares in his evil deeds. Scripture is pretty clear. Doctrine matters. There is a difference, as we're going to recognize today. It's not just, hey, forgive me, you say forgiveness of sins, they say forgiveness of sins. It might have different meaning, but it's all good. There's a difference in it. And, and, and it matters, and we need to make sure that we are holding fast the pattern of sound words, that we are holding fast to that doctrine. So let's recognize some of them. Because we recognized last time how beautiful and how awesome it is, the fact that we have the opportunity to have our sins forgiven, and whenever that happens, the hope that we now have, the confidence that we can now have, the assurance that we can now have. But there are doctrines out there that try to preach and teach that same hope, but in reality, at the end of the day, offer and provide no hope. The first one I want to look at this morning, and I will say this, I am probably going to be moving through these pretty quickly. So if you're going to try to write down every note, that probably typically happens with me. You might not be able to get down every note that I have on the slides. You can get the slides from our website at 84church.com, and you can ask me if you want me to. I can email you the outline, email you the charts. But the first one that I want to talk about is imputation of Christ's righteousness. Imputation of Christ's righteousness. This is a doctrine that uh, has been there for a period of time. It is definitely something that's tied to Calvinism. It's definitely something that's a part of the uh, Calvinistic tulip, if you will. But what is the doctrine? What is the basics of the doctrine? Well, the basics of the doctrine is this. First of all, they take that idea or that word impute. It's translated impute in Scripture, and you see it all over the place in Romans chapter 4. And what they teach that that word means is transfer. That that word, that, that, that it means, the original Greek meaning, what it means in Scripture when you read it, is transfer. And we're going to come back to that. But what they say that means is it means transfer this word, impute. And so what they then develop and what comes as a result of that are three types of imputation or transfer. They say, first of all, that Adam's sin is transferred. They'd say impute, but what they're meaning is transferred. Transferred to all of mankind. They then say that man's sin is transferred to Christ. And then they say Christ's righteousness is transferred to the believer. So what you see happening is this transfer of sin and transfer of Christ's righteousness to man. Now let's go look at that doctrine and go see if this stands and if this is true on the basis of what we taught and what we went through last week. Remember, all we did last week was went through Scripture and say this is what Scripture lays out. This is what Scripture teaches about forgiveness of sin. This is a doctrine that's espoused by many in the religious world. And unfortunately, there are many within the church that might not know that they are espousing it, but by the very words that they are saying, they are implying the same thing that those in the world do, that those in the denominational world do. And we need to make sure that we're not doing that. So let's take this scripture and com or th this idea, this doctrine that is there, and say, is this a doctrine of men that they've taken and twisted, or is this a doctrine that is actually Christ's doctrine? I want to start with that first one. We'll come back to imputes and what that means, but I want to start with Adam's sin being transferred to all mankind. Is this the truth? Is that something that happens? Adam's sin is imputed or transferred to all of mankind. The teaching is that uh, is all mankind is in sin because Adam sinned. They say that this is separate and apart from the individual's choices and actions. So because Adam sinned, we are now inherently sinful. We inherited Adam's sin is what they're saying. Well, is that scriptural? 
Not what we looked at last time. It is true, Romans 3, 23, as we laid out that all have sinned. Remember, Paul in that section of Scripture, backing up, starting in verse, I believe it's 9, going through 18. But definitely through this whole chapter, what he's laying out to the, uh, to the brethren at Rome is this. Both Jew and Gentile have sinned. Why? Because all have made the choice to sin. And we see that in Ezekiel 18. Ezekiel 18, verse 20, lays this out. An Old Testament passage lays out the principle that we see that the soul, verse 20, whose sin shall die. The soul shall not bear the guilt of the, or the, the, the son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. In other words, if you make the choice to sin, you bring that sin upon yourself. It doesn't come from your father. It doesn't come from anywhere else. You have made that choice to sin. We recognize when we looked at Psalm 51 with David, whenever he was repenting of his sin, that he didn't say, forgive me of the sins that I inherited from Adam or from my father. He goes through and he says, I have done this. I have committed this. Forgive me of my sin and my actions. Go through and read it. What that's pointing to isn't the fact that he inherited sin or it wasn't transferred to him from his father or Adam or anyone else, but that he made that choice to sin. In a scripture that we didn't have up last week, but that goes right along with this, you get into Romans chapter 5, verse 12, is it all have sinned. Paul continues here with this thought, says in verse 12 of chapter 5, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because why? Why did death spread to all men? Because all sin. In other words, all made the choice to go against God's law. And that's something we've got to keep in mind. What is sin? Well, 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, sin is lawlessness. So all have made the choice to do what? All have made the choice to not be obedient to God's law in some manner, shape, or form. It doesn't matter if it's one. doesn't matter if it's a hundred. All have made that choice, and that is why you're separated from God, not because you took on Adam's sin. And so what do we conclude from Scripture? That this aspect, at least, of the doctrine is not true. That Adam's sin didn't transfer to all mankind. Every individual made the choice to sin. But let's go further. Let, let's, let's look at their next point. Because that's the first one. They, they start with this idea. Adam's sin transfers to all of mankind. But then they say, man's sin is transferred to Christ. Right? In other words, what those are saying, those who believe this doctrine, what they teach is Jesus became sin. Our sin came upon him. What happened whenever Jesus went on the cross is he was sin at that point in time. He became sin. Is that true? Is that scriptural? Did Jesus become sin? Whenever we look at scripture, we recognize and realize real quickly that isn't the case. I want us to first look at Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4 through 6. Because this is one of the scriptures in which they will go to try to prove that doctrine. Isaiah 53, 4 through 6, no doubt a prophecy of Christ hanging on the cross. And what is said there is surely has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was laid upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. All we like, a, uh, like, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. What does all that language point to? It doesn't point to the fact that Jesus took on sin, that he became sin, that he was not sin, but now he took on our sins and, and, and Jesus was sin, but that Jesus bore the, uh, bore the penalty of sin. What happened on the cross was Jesus bore that punishment that we were deserving of. That's what happened on the cross. And the question that we need to ask ourselves is this. If Christ became sin, then how was he the perfect sacrifice? Because what made Jesus the perfect sacrifice was what? What made him the perfect sacrifice is that he did not sin. Hebrews 4.15. Jesus was tempted in all ways that we were, yet without what? Without sin. Jesus did not sin. Because that, he became the perfect sacrifice. We also see then, I don't have this up on the chart, but we also have that in 2 Corinthians 521 that Jesus knew no sin now it might say in there and, and, and you might see something supplied in there by uh, translators that might lead you to think that he took on sin but the whole idea there is Jesus knew no sin and what did he become he became the offering of sin 
That's what we see throughout Scripture. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19 teaches us something. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, we know that redemption is through him, through his blood, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless, con uh, from your aimless conduct received by traditions of your fathers, but with what? With the precious blood of the Lamb. What were we redeemed by? By the precious blood of the Lamb. Why was it precious? Well, what was it like? It was like a lamb, as of a lamb, without blemish and without spot. So what was Jesus in? He was without sin. That's what made his sacrifice perfect. That's what made his sacrifice giving us the ability to have our sins forgiven in the first place. He becomes the propitiation of our sins or the appeasement of our sins. Why? Because he was the perfect sacrifice. There was no sin in him. We have redemption through his blood. Why do we have redemption through his blood? Because his blood was the perfect sacrifice. He was that perfect sacrifice without spot, without blemish. There was no sin in him. If Jesus took on sin and became sin, how could any of us have that atoning blood? How can any of us be appeased through him? The answer is it can't. That can't happen. Because as we read in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 3 through 18, Jesus was that perfect sacrifice sacrifice and so what do we recognize from scripture what we recognize is jesus didn't become sin but bore the punishment of sin it's not that jesus took on sin he took on the punishment of sin that's what he bore on our behalf that's why we have the opportunity for forgiveness of sins but then the last one and you know those first two there are many out there that might not actually communicate those but so many communicate this last one, and I think there might even be a misunderstanding, unfortunately, within our brethren regarding this last one. In regards to, is Christ's righteousness transferred to the believer? Okay, so they start with Adam's sin, that it's transferred to all mankind, and then man's sins transfer over to Christ. Well, that can't be the case because that would make Christ uh, not, uh, not a perfect sacrifice. But then they go to this last one. Well, what happens is Christ's righteousness is transferred to the believer. And whenever they say this, what they're saying is, and the concept is, the righteousness of Jesus covers us as a blanket covers an object. In other words, whenever God looks down from heaven, or whenever God looks down, he doesn't see the sin that is there. The sin is still there, but what he sees is the righteousness of Christ covering him as an object might cover them, like a blanket covering an object. Or, you know, some might uh, explain it like an umbrella, right? There, there, there's this umbrella of Christ's righteousness over them. And so God, whenever he looks down, he doesn't see sin. What he sees is Christ's righteousness. Is this true? Because like I said, this, this is one that many would actually espouse. They, they, they would actually communicate this one. The other two they might not, unless they were preachers of that doctrine and teachers and have studied that and have been indoctrinated by that. But there are many who might go down this path and, and agree with this and even think that this is true. I want us to look at Scripture and see, is this true? Is this doctrine scriptural? Romans chapter 4, 4 through 8, which we read last time. And what we recognize this is we become righteous how? We become righteous because our sins are forgiven. That's what Paul is pointing out in that chapter. The righteousness doesn't come through the works of the law, the old law. There, 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 there's no amount of old law keeping or law keeping that you can do to make yourself righteous because you have sinned. So what do you need? Well, all are in need in the blood of Christ and all are justified in that way. And whenever that happens, that's whenever sins are forgiven. But we recognize something else about forgiveness of sins. And I'm sorry, especially in the back of those last two are small print. But what we're looking at here is the fact that sins are remembered no more and are removed as far as the east is from the west. We recognize that last time. So we become righteous when? We become righteous when our sins are forgiven. And what, who is righteous? We are righteous. So it's not Christ's righteousness over us and we are still sin. We are now righteous. Why? Well, because our sins are forgiven. But what happens when sins are forgiven? We talked about this last time. This is important to note. What happens when sins are forgiven? Well, when sins are forgiven, they are remembered no more. They don't stay on us, and then we're in this situation where God looks down, and, 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 and we're still in sin, but he sees Christ's righteousness. They are gone and remembered no more. Hebrews 10, 16 through 18. 
This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds I will write them. Then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering of sin. Where there is remission of sins, where there is forgiveness of sins, it's a remembering no more. It's not that God looks down and sees Christ's righteousness. We are now righteous. Why are we righteous? Because our sins are removed. And that is described in detail, and a picture is painted for us over in Psalm 103, verses 9 through 12. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as, high, or for, as the heavens are, for as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward us, those who fear him. As far as the east from the west... So far has he removed our transgressions from us. As far as the east is from the west, going in opposite directions, that's how far removed our sins and our transgressions are. It's not that our sins and transgressions are removed from the east to the west because all God sees is Christ's righteousness. It's because our sins have been forgiven and are remembered no more. And it might seem like that this is not a big deal. It might seem like, well, does it, is that really that big of a deal? Because end of the day what we recognize is this sins are not covered so that god sees the righteousness of christ instead of sin they are forgiven and remembered no more they are gone god doesn't remember them as we talked last week there might be earthly consequences to your sin if you commit murder in this country you still have to serve jail time you might be forgiven by god and that's certainly the point you want to get to there still might be consequences to those but as far as your guilt before god it's no more and it's certainly not just a covering that God looks down and all he sees is righteousness of Christ. But we are still sin. Sin is gone and it's remembered no more. This is important to understand and to recognize. And I want us to, to, to recognize and go back to that idea of impute, right? Because those are the three layers of it. And we see that, that none of them stand within Scripture. But those are the three layers of this idea of imputation of Christ's righteousness. But let's go look at that word impute just real quickly. Whenever you go look at it and you go look at the original meaning that was there in the Greek, and these come from multiple different uh, lexiconog lexiconographers, if I can say that, in their definition of this word. Count, account, reckon, to take inventory. Is there in any of those words the idea of transfer? No. None of these allude to a transfer, to either a transfer of anything, and in this case a transfer of sin or a transfer of righteousness. Sins are not transferred from one place to another. They are forgiven and remembered no more and understand that that's a problem that those who hold this doctrine, that they have. Because what continues to happen to sin? Is sin ever done away with? No, sin goes from Adam to all the mankind, and then it goes where? Then it goes to Christ after that, right? That's what they say. So is sin ever remembered no more? Not according to their doctrine. It's transferred, and it's moving all over the place. And the righteousness of Christ is transferred upon us. And, and, and they, they would even espouse, because that transfer of Christ is, is, is transferred upon us, and we can continue to live in sin and continue to be sin, but all God sees is Christ's righteousness. That's a problem. The word itself that they say means transfer, that they really use to, to uh, come up with this entire doctrine, that's not even what the word means. In fact, you go look at Romans chapter 4. And in Romans chapter 4, it's pretty clear what you have there. Romans chapter 4, the question that Paul is laying out is who is the one who is counted as righteous? He's looking at the fact of impute, or that's the word that's translated there. It's also translated in multiple other words throughout that entire chapter, account and count and others, as you go throughout the chapter. The same Greek word is used over and over again. But whenever Paul is looking there in Romans chapter 4, the question that's being presented or he's going for uh, is this, or he's putting forth is this, who is the one who's counted as righteous? It's not the one who does the works of the old law. It's no matter of law keeping, if you will, from that standpoint. It's the one whose sins are forgiven and remembered no more. That's the one who's counted as righteous. It's that simple. He goes on in Romans chapter 6, verse 1, to talk about the fact that we are not to continue in sin, 
Because our sins have been forgiven, that doesn't give us the ability to continue in sin. He, he, he says over in Romans chapter 6, verse 1, what then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? He said, certainly not. It isn't something that you are to do. And so that goes against the doctrine of imputed righteousness of Christ, uh, the imputation of Christ's righteousness. Like I said, one might look at this and say, okay, but is it really that big of a deal? I mean, I understand what you're saying, that it's not the imputation of Christ's righteousness from the standpoint of God looks down and sees the righteousness of Christ, but what it is is Christ became that payment for our sins, and our sins are remembered no more. But is it really that big of a deal? You know, it really is whenever you start to think about the logical conclusions of this doctrine. This doctrine might seem to offer hope, right? There are those that say, man, that, that sounds good. Christ's righteousness is there. And so whenever I am in sin or continuing to sin or living a, a life of sin, it's okay. I can have assurance because what God sees is the righteousness of Christ. Well, first of all, that doctrine is not true as we saw. That doctrine is not true. But what ends up happening as a result of that is individuals continue to live in sin. Understand that the righteousness of Christ covers me. That's, that's the idea that, that, that many are espousing, and you'll see it in this phrase or this terminology, he was perfect, so I don't have to be. You ever heard that? You might have even uttered it at one point in time or, or had those thoughts. Hey, you know what? Christ was perfect, so I don't have to be. And the whole idea is Christ is perfect and his perfect righteousness is there and that's what God has seen so I don't have to live perfectly. I can live however I want. The reality is this doctrine keeps you in your sin. Your sin is never truly removed. I want you to think about that. Think about the logical conclusions of that. What this doctrine espouses is that you are still sin. You are still in sin but all God sees is Christ's righteousness. Your sin is never truly removed. You're still guilty of sin. That goes completely against Scripture. It goes completely against the assurance that Scripture gives us that we can have a hope of heaven. The reality is this doctrine keeps you in sin, and it keeps one in sin in many ways. First of all, we, sit, we wonder why some struggle with assurance. Well, assurance comes from, according to Scripture, the teaching that your sins will be remembered no more. But this doctrine keeps you in your sin because your sins aren't remembered no more, you are still in sin. It's just Christ's righteousness is now covering you. This is why so many struggle with assurance. I also believe this is why so many out there might struggle with the fact and hold on to that guilt that has been forgiven. Because according to the doctrine, you are still in sin. That goes completely against Scripture. It goes completely against the hope that God gives us, but not only that, we wonder why so many continue to sin, although they claim to be a Christian. Why do so many continue to live in sin, although they claim to be a Christian? They continue to live in sin because they don't think that there is going to be the punishment of sin. They think God just sees the righteousness of Christ. Brethren, it goes completely against the doctrine of Christ, and it does matter. It keeps one held down in their sin, it keeps the guilt upon them, and it opens up the door for sin to persist which is completely against what Paul talks about in Scripture and what Scripture lays out. We are not to be those who commit lawlessness. Whenever we are baptized, as he says in Romans chapter 6, when we are forgiven, whenever our sins are removed, we have a new master that we are serving. And we are not to continue to live in sin or to continue live. Uh, we, we are now to live um, for our new master, for righteousness, as he says again in Romans chapter 6. But not only do we have imputation of Christ's righteousness. Again, th th this is a doctrine that's prevalent. We need to be very careful that if we go down the path of any of those lines of thinking or, or, or utter this idea that the reason why I'm forgiven or the, the, the reason why I'm okay is because God just, there, there's this righteousness that's over me. God just sends righteousness on me. That's not at all what we see. We are forgiven. We are forgiven of our sins and they are remembered no more. Certainly Christ was a perfect sacrifice for us. But another doctrine that, 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 that is out there, that is prevalent and is gaining steam, is becoming very popular within churches of Christ, is this idea of continual cleansing. And I want to start off by saying this is nothing new. I believe it was in the 80s. I mean, Harry, am I right? Was it about the 80s whenever this was very popular? 70s, even before the 80s. 
70s, 80s at that time. So th this doctor was very popular. Th this is nothing that's new, but it's coming back, and it's becoming prevalent. And it's this idea, whenever you look at the basics of the doctrine, that after one is saved, the blood of Christ continues to cleanse even as one sins. So after one has been saved, they, they, they would say one needs to be saved first. But after they have been saved and they're in that saved condition, the blood of Christ continues to cleanse you even as you sin, even as one sins. And they use this analogy. And this is not my words. This is actually the words that are used that you can go find from sermons that were preached, articles that were written by brethren who profess continual cleansing. The analogy that they use is of a windshield wiper. The idea there is once the rain hits the windshield, or hits the windshield, the wiper wipes it away. It's gone in that sense. And so they apply that and say this is what it's like with the blood of Jesus. When we sin, the blood of Jesus takes care of that sin automatically. It has nothing to do with repentance. It has nothing to do with confession. It has nothing to do with forgiveness of sins. Or, or sorry, asking for forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness of sin that we've committed. It has nothing to do with that. What they say is that blood of Jesus automatically takes care of that sin. And so let's go and look at this doctrine. Let's see if this is true. First of all, we recognize what we noticed last week. The Christian who sins. The Christian who sins. Is there something they need to do? Or are they automatically forgiven of that sin that they commit after they have been saved, after they have been baptized? I want us to go over to an account that we have in Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, in verse 22. Acts chapter 8, verse 22. We see an example with Simon the sorcerer. And after Simon had been baptized, he commits a sin. We recognize that as you read down through it, that, 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 that he was wanting the ability and offered money to get the ability of, of the Holy Spirit and, and, and the gift that was there. And we recognize as we get down into verse 22 what Peter says to him. He's already been baptized, mind you. Remember that. This is a Christian. In verse 22, Peter tells him, Repent, therefore, of this your great wickedness, and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. We recognize that something needs to be done. It's not an automatic that the blood of Jesus cleansed them and that he was forgiven of his sins. What does he need to do? Repent, therefore, of this great wickedness and pray to God if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. When was the thought of his heart going to be forgiven him? Whenever he repented and whenever he prayed. And not only that, but we go over to 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, holding fast the pattern of sound words, and we read something else. If we confess our sins, that if is a pretty big word, if. That's conditional. If you do this, what is this? If we confess our sins, then what? Then he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. When are we cleansed of all unrighteousness? When are our sins forgiven? If we confess our sins. We hold fast the pattern of sound words and we recognize something. That it's not whenever we sin, as we sin, that the blood of Jesus forgives us, that our sins are remembered no more. But it's when we repent. Whenever we confess and whenever we ask for forgiveness for those things, that is when sins are forgiven. Keep in mind that sin is lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. So whenever you commit that which is lawlessness, whenever you go against God's word, what do you need to do? You need to repent of that. You need to turn from it. You need to get as far away from it as you possibly can. You need to change your will about it and put it into action. You need to ask for forgiveness and you need to confess. But I also want to bring up 2 Corinthians 7, 10 through 11. Because those who espouse continual cleansing will generally say, well, as long as you have this general attitude of repentance, okay? They wouldn't necessarily completely throw out repentance, although by the very nature of the words that they use, it seems like nothing else is needed. They would agree that something might need to be there, but what they're going to say is it's, well, it's a general attitude. You need to be ready to repent. You need to be prepared to repent. But I want us to go look at something over in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 through 10 regarding repentance. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 7, 10 through 11. 
For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be, not, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. For observe this very thing, that you sorrowed in a godly manner, what diligence it produced in you, what clearing of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, what vindication. In all things you, were proved, you proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Does that language that was used there to describe those who showed that they were repentant, that they had that godly sorrow that produced an action, produced a changing of one's will, does any of that language there lead to the idea of a general repentance? I want you to especially notice that last phrase there, that last phrase that's there in verse 11. In all things, you proved yourself to be cleared in this matter. You proved yourself in all things to be clear in this matter. How can one be clear in a matter without actually putting repentance into action? How can one be cleared in a matter without actually changing one's will and changing one's action to no longer do that anymore? It's not possible. All that we see there and all the language that is used is not a general attitude that, hey, I will change. That certainly needs to be there. You need to have the heart and the willingness to change if you realize what you've done is sin. But it's not just that general attitude. It's an actual putting into action. Is the doctrine scriptural? It by no means is scriptural. Nowhere in scripture is it stated or the principle is given that sins are forgiven without the sin being repented of, confessed, and one asking for repentance. One asking for uh, for forgiveness of that, repenting of that sin. We need to recognize that, and we need to understand that, because this doctrine, just like the other one, you think about it, it keeps one in their sin, or it keeps one continuing in their sin. In fact, what you might see, and I've seen it with those who started off with this idea of continual cleansing, is they kind of get backed into a corner, and you know what they eventually end up going to? the imputation of Christ's righteousness? Because they understand that sins are only forgiven whenever this happens, and so what do they got to do? Well, this individual is still in their sin. They never really asked or repented of this sin, so what does God see? They see God's, uh, or they, they, God looks down and sees Christ's righteousness. Understand the dangers of these doctrines and understand the fact that we need to stand against them. Brethren, the forgiveness of sins is foundational to the faith. That's what we laid out last time. That's the point of Scripture. Scripture leads, the, 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 the whole scheme is the scheme of redemption. The whole purpose and point is, is, is to bring man to a right relationship with God, to bring, bring about fa uh, salvation. And how does that happen? Well, that only happens whenever one has forgiveness of sins. That's the only way that it can happen. And Scripture is pretty clear about it. When sins are forgiven, they are remembered and gone, or remembered no more. They are removed and gone. We are not sin with the covering over us. Sin has been removed, and something needs to be done whenever we sin. This occurs, as we talked about last time, whenever the Christian believes, repents, confesses, and is baptized. And the Christian who sins, if they sin, it's not just an automatic wiping away of that sin. It's not that God looks down and sees Christ's righteousness and so you can continue to live in your sin. That sin is gone and removed and remembered no more. Remember the warning that Peter gives, that John gives, that we see throughout Scripture of the importance of standing for this doctrine. Brethren, this is not a preacher fight. This is not for the elders. This is for you. This is for all Christians. We have to stand for the truth. Don't leave this to just the preachers to fight against it. Don't leave this just for the elders to deal with it. You need to understand that these doctrines are keeping people in sin. That according to the doctrine, sin is never really removed. And it opens up the door and breeds more sin to occur. This, no doubt, is offering hope where there is no hope. This, no doubt, is taking and twisting scripture to their own destruction. This, no doubt, is why doctrine matters and why we don't need to receive one who does not bring the doctrine of Christ. Remember something, brethren. Remember something. That we become righteous. How? By having our sins forgiven and removed. Not having the blood of Christ just cover us. 
and not having it just wiped away without our repentance. Remember that we are to be spotless and without blame, that we are to be prepared for the judgment day. Remember that we can have confidence and assurance. That's because our sins are remembered and removed, uh, <laughs> removed and remembered no more. These other doctrines keep you in your sin, and they don't bring about you being a righteous individual standing before God. It takes away and it shakes your confidence. We need to understand that. We need to recognize that. We need to understand that God shows his love, his mercy, and his grace whenever we are not deserving of it by removing our sins and remembering them no more. We need to remember that it gives so much comfort and confidence and assurance of our hope of salvation and don't let those in the world take and twist scripture, appearing to give and offer hope, but in reality teach a doctrine that keeps you from hope. Because that's unfortunately what so many do and what so many uh, are latching on to in believing. I hope this series, I, I hope these two lessons were edifying and encouraging. I know this time we laid out and we talked a lot about doctrine. And, you know, might have got lost in the weeds in, in some of those things. But remember the basis of where we started last time, there is so much hope in it. And if you are not one uh, who has had your sins forgiven in the ways that Scripture says, meeting the conditions that is laid out, then you need to seriously think about that, especially as we go throughout the remainder of this morning. If you have any questions or concerns about what was taught or said, and if you want to talk with me about this, please come talk with me. I love to talk with you, and I love to have a Bible study regarding these things. At this time, we'll be uh, led in a closing prayer by Curtis Davis, and then afterwards, we will uh, depart for our Bible classes. Let's bow and pray together. Father, we're so thankful for the blessings that we have in Christ.